All right, let's do this one last time. My name is Drew Dodger, and for the last couple months, I've been doing a podcast with my good buddy, Jacob Heron. While we love film in general, with us being artists and all, we have a fascination with animation, and we decided to start an audio podcast after we both geeked out over the animated Transformers movie. We're not perfect, we've gotten names wrong, and we don't always agree on movies, but at the end of the day, we try to bring an informative and entertaining show to you all, and we'd like to welcome you to The Cell Cast. Muppet Christmas Carol was directed by Brian Henson. It was written by Jerry Jewell and, of course, based on The Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, Mm -hmm. with songs by Paul Williams and the score by Miles Goodman. Now, going into the cast, I'm going to let y'all know this is going to get a little wordy because there's a lot here, because one person plays a bunch of characters and some of those characters are playing other characters, so... Bear with me. Or frog with me. <laughs> there's, the there's a lot of hands everywhere. Yeah, a lot. Okay, so. Ebenezer Scrooge was played by Michael Caine. Sir Michael Sir Michael Caine. And the thing I think he's most well known for right now is Alfred in the Dark Knight trilogy. Yes. The Great Gonzo plays Charles Dickens. Conrad Waldorf is, was Robert Marley. Dr. Bunsen Honeydew was a charity worker. Bettina Cratchit, a bunch of whatnots, and some pigs were performed by David Goles. Okay. And on the television t- series Dinosaurs, he played Earl Sinclair. Oh, okay. There's a lot of puppet things in this. Yeah, Fair warning. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> Rizzo the Rat played himself. Bean Bunny was a street urchin. Kermit the Frog playing Bo- played Bob Cratchit. Beaker as a charity worker, Belinda Cratchit, a laundress, Sprocket, pig businessmen, whatnots, rats, and ink spots were performed by Steve Whitmar. He is the second performer to play Ernie on Sesame Street, replacing Jim Henson. He replaced a lot of Jim Henson stuff. Oh, okay. But he is no longer employed under anything Muppet related at this point because there was a falling out between him and the Henson family. Hmm. Gotcha. There's not a lot that's known about that. Uh, Robin the Frog play, or let me rephrase. Kermit's nephew Robin played Tiny Tim Cratchit. Jerry Statler playing Jacob Marley. Ma Bear as Ma Fozziewig. Uh, the Ghost of Christmas present voice and face. Pops. He uh, New Zealand as a boomerang fish salesman. Mr. Applegate, Father Mouse, Pig Businessman, Rat Bookkeepers, Penguins, Ink Spots, and Singing Food was performed by Jerry Nelson, who is the original voice of Count Von Count on Sesame Street. Okay. <laughs> there again, a lot of hands in this yes. thing. <laughs> and keep in mind, this is their... A lot of these Muppets that I'm listing that they're performing, this is they're the primary performer mm-hmm. on these Muppets. So there are times when both two of these characters might be on screen at the same time, Mm -hmm. which means somebody else might have been performing that character on scene on screen at the time, but it would be gone back and voiced by the original performer. Got it. Miss Piggy plays Emily Cratchit, Fozzie Bear as Fozziewig, Sam the American Eagle as a British headmaster. Animal as the drummer in the in the band, of course. A vegetable seller and Mr. Bite was performed by Frank Oz, who, as we all know, plays Yoda in Star Wars. Oh, don't you say? And in the current movie Knives Out, which yep. I want to go see but haven't had a chance to go see yet, gotcha. He plays a character by the name of Alan Stevens. Really? Mm-hmm. Huh. Which I don't think is a puppet. Okay. But I could be wrong. <laughs> it could be a puppet. You never. I haven't seen the movie, so I don't know. Um, Peter Cratchit, one of the puppeteers on Old Joe, Swedish Chef, Wander McMooch, and a beggar was performed by David Rudman, who is the 
performer of Cookie Monster on Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. The voice of Old Joe was uh, David Shaw Parker, who was a British actor that the, the only thing I, th- I saw that we might recognize, if you've ever seen the show The Crown, he plays Hawker. Okay. I've not watched the show, so I don't know. Me either, but I've heard okay. a lot of good things about it. The performer for the Ghost of Christmas Presents body and the Ghost of Christmas Yet to Come's body mm-hmm. was Don Austin, who is also the principal plant puppeteer in Little Shop of Horrors. The Ghost oh. of Christmas Yet to Come puppeteer and one of the Ghost of Christmas Past puppeteers was Rob Tigner, who was the animatronics puppeteer for Splinter in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Really? Yes. Hmm. Also, he was one of the other principal plant puppeteers in Little Shop of Horrors. Hmm. Interesting. Another Ghost of Christmas Past puppeteer, as it took three people to do that puppet. And the voice of Daughter Mouse, I think the performer as well, Karen Prell. Hmm. And she played a character named Steve's Friend in the television show Blue's Clues. That was the main thing I saw that she had done. Really? And she played that role a bunch of times, according to IMDb. Another, yet another, Ghost of Christmas Past puppeteer. And a puppeteer on various other Muppets in the background was William Todd Jones. And on the BBC Narnia miniseries from way back in the day? Yeah. He was Aslan. Oh, okay. I think I remember seeing like little clips of that. Mm-hmm. The voice of the Ghost of Christmas Past is a, a woman by the name of Jessica Fox. Mm. She was obviously a younger then. Yeah. And she is on a British soap opera called Hollyoaks, which I've never heard of before. Mm. And she plays Nancy Osborne on that. Mm. But that was the main thing I saw that she had done. Oh, okay. That's what she's most known for besides Muppet Christmas Carol. The part of Fred was played by Stephen McIntosh, who in the Doctor Who Time Lash epi- the Doctor Who episode Time Lash, which was a seventh Doctor ep- uh, episode, so okay. uh, near before it got its first cancellation, he played a character named Gazak. Gazak. I've okay. not watched this one, so I don't know what it's about, but mm. that was the main thing I saw that he was in. Okay. The character of Clara was played by Robin Weaver. And on a British sitcom, The Inbetweeners, she played Pamela Cooper. I don't know. And Belle was played by Meredith Braun, and she had nothing really else listed. She had like six credits, beside, uh, including this one. None of them I recognized. Okay. So for audience out there, if you recognize any of these actors, actresses that... We may have not been familiar with. Or perhaps I missed something you think is more important than the thing I admit li- I listed. Yeah. Let us know. There we go. We won't ever talk about it on the show until that name comes up again. But yeah, but it will be helpful. It will be helpful, yes. All right. So, let's go to, you know, little budget details. Yes. All right. So, this movie was released on December 11th, oddly enough. Uh, 19... Right before my birthday. Yeah. It actually Hang on. Like... December 11th, you say? Yes. As of this recording, that would be tomorrow. Yes. What's the year? 2019. No. What's the year this came out? 1993. 90... 92. Sorry. 92. 02. 12. This movie is nearly... Is, is 28 years old tomorrow, if wow. I've done my math correctly. Ballparking, yes. Yes. Okay. We did not intend this, no, but I will not. gladly take it. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. So it was, it was released in, on December 11th, 1992, mm-hmm. with a budget of $12 million. Its opening weekend U.S. release was $5 million plus change. Its U.S. gross was... 27 million and change Mm -hmm. and it's worldwide gross was 32 million dollars and some change okay so a little disappointing on opening weekend yes 
eventually came out in the wash. Yeah. Which is good because Disney did fund one more sequel before it went back to somebody else. Yeah. Because uh, they did, they funded uh, Muppet Treasure Island, and then it went back, and then the distribution went to Columbia for uh, Muppet Muppets from Space. So, yeah, okay. I know a little bit of Muppet lore. Yeah. Uh, also, I do want to point out that a lot of the, a lot of what I listed there mm-hmm. was not on IMDb where yeah. I normally get stuff. I consulted the Muppet Wiki to get the complete list of Muppets that they performed in the movie. Oh, oh, oh. So I listed nearly every Muppet that had a name. <laughs> okay. Except for uh, most of the Electric Mayhem. Because they did not... Only Animal in that group had... Which was the, the band yeah. during Fozzie Wig's party. Mm-hmm. Most of the band did not have speaking roles in this movie. For okay. obvious reasons. I got you. Except for Animal, because he had quiet. <laughs> Pretty much, that's the best animal. I think it's the only time I've ever tried to do Animal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna do start with my like. Go for it. My first like. In order to get into my first like, I need to give share with you a little bit of trivia. Ah. Uh-huh. If you had to make a... Would you be surprised if I were to tell you that despite the obvious differences between this movie and the book... Okay. That this is considered by most uh, uh, Charles Dickens fans as the most accurate adaptation of A Christmas Carol ever made? I wouldn't be surprised. Do you want want to know why? Why? Because despite... Bob Cratchit being a frog and being married to a pig. Yeah. And the character of Jacob Marley being split into two characters and showing up at the Fozzy, the Fezziwig uh, uh, Christmas party, despite the fact they were not in the Fezziwig, the, 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 the Fezziwig party in the book. This movie actually has the most lines and, uh, and most, uh, the, mo- the most dialogue and narration used in an adaptation. Most of this comes, most of the, all the lines come straight from the book. And that mm. amount of respect mm-hmm. for the adapted work, plus the respect for all of the Muppet work that had come before this, and the melding of these two to cast exactly which character for which role is one of the things I absolutely love about this movie. Hmm. Because here's the thing. Kermit the Frog was originally... uh, They originally were not going to cast him in the movie. What? They were going to... The original idea was this is... Because this is the first major Muppet production after Jim Henson's death. Yeah. They were going to retire every Muppet he voiced out of respect. Oh, wow. Wow. That was the concept. I think they ended up changing their minds, especially for this movie, when they realized there was only one Muppet character who fit the role of Tiny Tim correctly. And that is, of course, uh, his nephew Robin, because yeah. in The Muppet Show, and anywhere at time he shows up, he is designed as the character who is so cute and lovable you can't help but smile when he's singing and stuff. All his skits in The Muppet Show are the childlike songs that are just so sweet to hear and listen to. No really not really funny, but kind of just make you smile, let you breathe a little before you know the next thing. He's so cute not to be a, he's so cute that you can feel your teeth rot uh, type I of character. You. Yeah. So casting him as Tiny Tim Despite the fact that Tiny Tim has a grand total of two scenes in the book, yeah, you immediately can get attached quickly to Tiny Tim. Because that's the problem you run into with most of these adaptations, is they cast the main character of whatever their whatever franchise is adapting a Christmas Carol. Yeah, they put them as Scrooge. Mm-hmm. They will put three characters who are related to the person they've got playing Scrooge playing the ghosts. Mm-hmm. This one. They cast a human as Scrooge, not a Muppet, mm-hmm. and they created three original Muppets for the ghosts. In other words, 
the Muppets don't have the leading roles no, in this don't. movie. The the main Muppets. Yeah. Every, um, with Robin playing Tiny Tim, the only person that makes sense to play Bob Cratchit is Kermit. Mm-hmm. If you've got Bob, if you've got Kermit the Frog playing Bob Cratchit, and he has to be have a wife, you have to cast Miss Piggy because she will kill you otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't cross the pig. <laughs> yes, and it helps that in the movie previous, this technically Kermit and Miss Piggy got married. But that doesn't really affect this, considering the yeah. the, the setting of this That's movie. That's always been a weird union in my mind. Well, admittedly, we didn't get pogs or figs in this one like we were expecting. Yeah. <laughs> we got all the ladies being pigs and all the men being frogs. <laughs> but, of course, uh, Belinda, Bettina, and Peter, those were all original characters for this also. Really? Yeah. They were not, and that's why Peter actually matches Kermit's skin tone, but Robin doesn't. Oh, okay. That if you didn't sense. notice that. Because Robin's, Robin's a slightly different, because technically Robin has different parents than, Robin's only a nephew, Robin's only a nephew to Kermit. Yeah. He's got a whole other family line thing going there. Uh, and then, of course, the most oddball casting anyone could ever think of, casting Gonzo as Charles Dickens. <laughs> yes. To read the narration. <laughs> and... It works! It does! <laughs> Part of that is you've got Rizzo just there for the food. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and the, they the provide <laughs> And they provide great comic relief throughout the whole oh, thing. Oh, yes. <laughs> but the casting on... Because, honestly, the only other role I think you can throw Gonzo in is Bob. Bob yeah. Cratchit. Mm-hmm. And you could easily have had, maybe, say, one of the chickens, Camilla probably, playing Emily... But then that would have gotten real annoying real quickly. <laughs> so, I, this works, if we're being honest. Yeah. Uh, for this. And I love it. And it will lead into my number two. Okay. So, you're number one. My number one. Now, there again, to our audience listening, be like, I do not have it as the nostalgia or the... The overwhelming love that Drew has for the Muppets. I'm working on them, folks. <laughs> Apparently. So, uh, my my first like would actually be Rizzo the Rat. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> love Rizzo. <laughs> uh, that's understandable. He's everyone's favorite character. And he, as a little bit of spoiler, he was not created until two movies before this. Really? Yeah, he was not in the Muppet show at all. He was created for... Uh, the great no, the movie movie right before this, he was created for Muppets Take Manhattan to work because they needed a bunch of rats to work in a New York kitchen. Oh, of course, because that would be funny. And Rizzo was the main rat that came out of that. Yeah, and then he was in this movie. So I got you. Yeah, Rizzo was just the be like there again, like you said that Rizzo and uh, Gonzo, Gonzo, thank you, were just the comedy relief. They made you laugh. They mm-hmm. was like. The Pratt Falls in which they go through, they are the co- the the comedy trio of this movie that just make you laugh out loud beyond relief. And poor Rizzo gave punched out the window every freaking other time. <laughs> was hysterical. Like him- oh, my favorite scene though with Rizzo, just to get this out of mm-hmm. the way. Rizzo has to jump off the fence so they can get up to... They can get into the backyard so they can climb <laughs> yes. the thing. He forgets his jelly bean, so he crawls under the fence, grabs his jelly beans, <laughs> crawls back under the fence, and Gonzo says, you could fit through the, through the fence? He says, yeah. He says, you're such an idiot. Yes. <laughs> it's like, if Gonzo is calling you an idiot, yes. <laughs> considering what he does to himself... <laughs> that is true. You are an idiot. <laughs> Sorry. Continue with Rizzo. You're good. Rizzo, I just, I really enjoyed it. Now, now there again, like the first time ever I actually, I think, seeing Rizzo, I knew of the character, and I remember he wasn't in Muppet Babies. Okay. All that said, Rizzo was my favorite character of this movie. Like, yes, there were a ton of amazing characters that just personified the Charles Dickens mm-hmm. classic uh, novel. Yes. But Rizzo just stuck out every time he was there. Like, okay, what is this rat going to do now? <laughs> So yes, yeah, so that's my then, number one. And then there's the other, my other favorite scene as they're attached to Michael Caine, and while while they're heading to the past, yes, and Rizzo's just going, 
I don't remember. I don't remember what Gonzo says, but it's completely punctuated perfectly by Rizzo going, "Mommy," because <laughs> he's scared out of his living ever living mind. And then they land in front of the cat. <laughs> I remember that. Like, oh no, get away from me! Get away from me! Yes. Oh, it can't get any worse than this. <laughs> anyway. What is your number two? My number two. I like that Gonzo and Rizzo disappear for the go- for during uh, the Ghost of Christmas yet to come. Yes. Because, honestly, as much as I love the comedy in the other two yes. up to this point, that scene, th- th- those scenes need to be serious. They need to be yes. dour. They need to be depressing. Yeah. And having their comedy come in, I mean, honestly, you can't have them do their comedy. Mm-hmm. And if they don't do their comedy, they have the only person who's got a role is Gonzo. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think, and admittedly, while I'm actually reading through Christmas Carol now for the very first time in my life, really, I haven't gotten to the Ghost of Christmas pr- Future Christmas yet to come, so I don't know what the what I'm what I ha- mm-hmm. I don't know yet because yeah. I've not read that part. But I can't imagine any of the comedic elements I've read up to this point mm-hmm. in his in his writing fit that act. So I'm actually very glad that they disappear for that because it allows the three scenes that in this section in question to mm-hmm. play with have as much impact as they need. Mm-hmm. Because let's face it, the comedy would have taken away from that. Yeah, I agree. And that actually will lead into my third. Okay. So your second. My second. Well, I'm going to rearrange my order just a little bit because I just it dawned on me that I'm missing one crucial part of this entire movie. And that would be Sir Michael Caine. Mm-hmm. Mwah! Amazing job, like always, with Michael yes. uh, Caine. Just every I, time. Personally, I think he's the best Scrooge. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I'll be like, I've seen, you know, a, quite a few adaptations mm-hmm. of A Christmas Carol a few times. And be like, when you see, um, you know, Sir Patrick Stewart. Yeah, Pat- and, Sir, Patrick, Sir Patrick Stewart did a good one. Yes. This, now, I think I've read, or I've heard The Christmas Carol before. Mm-hmm. And it, it feel what I understand of the story, this seems... The dialogue is taken directly from the book. It it's, is. It's most, not... Most of the lines are taken word for word. Yes. And it's only in a couple instances where... Like, for instance, I know there's one line when he's meeting the ghost of Christmas past mm-hmm. that in the book he thought the line and the ghost replied anyway. Yeah. Because it it was reading his mind, and in the book, in the movie, they just had him speak the line okay. because it makes just as much sense there. Yeah, it's very light adaptation when they decide to use exact dialogue. Yeah, and they take a lot of exact dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just to where be like you had a character. I don't. I can't. I can't right now. I can't even place where this uh, story, the time frame, it would take place. But it it had this. You know the. It had a sense of where I had, let me let me rephrase what I was going to say because it takes place in Victorian era London. Yes, that's when all of Dickens stuff takes place. Okay, well let me wrap up what I'm trying to say without stuttering and mumbling my entire way through. Mm-hmm. That um, Kane does a phenomenal job mm-hmm. in this role that makes you believe that he is actually you know Scrooge. Mm-hmm. That. His performance is very compelling that a man who has gone from just be like, you know, cold hearted man who's very solitude and very, you know, about greed and self to coming to the realization that be like all the people I've hurt, all the people be like what I've been doing up to the, to, to the present and due to what the spirits have told him, mm-hmm. be like you f- really feel that conviction through uh, Kane's performance. Yeah. And it's really moving. It's somewhat convicting in some ways mm-hmm. that you are kind of it's like, do you be like, how do I treat others? How yeah. do I do, do I respect people the way I should instead of just, you know, like low browing them be like, Oh, you're below me. Mm-hmm. It's so it kind of, 
it convicts you and kind of gives you a, a moral story of just uh, treat others with dignity mm-hmm. and not try to, you know, undermine them for your own gain. And so I, you know, I, that's what I primarily got from Kane's performance. It was real, be like Kane, uh, Sir Michael Kane is just phenomenal actor mm-hmm. that I think anything I've ever seen him in, he does felt like phenomenal job. So yes, my second would be Sir Michael Kane's performance. Okay. What is your number three? My number three involves a frog. Uh, I have been watching the Muppets for pretty much as long as I can remember. The only other franchise I can say that of is Star Trek. Mm. And in pretty much any... And here's the thing. I know this is not Kermit the Frog himself. This is... The way the logic behind this movie is, is it's Kermit the Frog playing Mm -hmm. Bob Cratchit. Yes. He's not him. He's not playing himself. He's playing Bob. Yeah, he's playing and character. Steve Whitmire does a very good job of playing Kermit as Bob. Yes, but it's so the performance of Kermit as Bob is so close to Kermit Sands Bob mm-hmm. that in my mind I can't separate it. Okay, and that is the thing. In any previous Muppet perf- show, any Muppet thing. Before or since this one, mm-hmm. we've seen Kermit happy. We've seen Kermit angry. We've seen him literally hopping mad. <laughs> I'm not making a pun there. The pun was made by the show. Okay, then. <laughs> I am copying what they said. We have seen every emotion out of him except broken. Yeah. This is the only movie where we see Kermit the Frog broken. Yeah. Now, as someone who's watched it, yeah. to some degree, Kermit the Frog is a hero to me because in my childhood, that was a character I kind of look up to. Yeah. Just like, you know, any other character you look up to that's obviously not real. Yeah. And the fact that even when he got anger, and, and this is what I appreciate, it's not just that he was broken and that's hard to watch. Yeah. Because it is very hard to watch. Every time this scene comes up mm-hmm. in this movie... And it does not happen in any other Christmas Carol I've ever watched. I cannot tell you why, other than the connection, Kermit, the connection with Kermit. I actually cry slightly. Hmm. My throat closes up because I'm watching Kermit the Frog, a character who, even in the worst of times that he goes through, yeah. is able to get calm, to handle the situation, and get past. And in this one, he's completely broken to the fact that he can't he has a hard time doing pretty much anything yeah in that scene even talking when he's talking to miss piggy and yet he has that speech Mm -hmm. about the first parting among us Mm -hmm. and he's back to that kermit the frog where yeah he's still feeling that emotion but he is that foundation of the Muppets once again. Now, yeah, it's just the foundation of that family in that scene. But the fact that he's able to be that foundation again. Yeah. Despite being broken. I absolutely love because it gives some hope. Even though this is a timeline that's not go- we're not going to have to say. It's yeah. not going to occur. Yeah. The fact that his character, even as Bob Cratchit. Yes. As Kermit. Or Kermit as Bob. He's able to make, to, to still be the foundation of everything that family stands for Mm -hmm. so that they themselves can, it's what a father's supposed to be. If we're being honest in that situation, we're not saying, I hate people will claim toxic masculinity for people not showing emotions. That's not what's happening. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, Yeah, but Kermit is showing emotion here. He is broken. You can see he's broken, but he's still there for his family. Yeah. He's still being that rock. He's still the rock that the family needs. And throughout the Muppets, he has always been the rock. Mm-hmm. He's, I'm never going to say he's the perfect straight man, because even though he is a straight man in many Muppet skits, yeah, because he has his own skits where he's actually the, the comedian, and a better comedian, much better comedian than Fozzie Bear. <laughs> but this was the moment that made me go, okay, I don't know who you are, Steve, but you know this character. Yeah, 
I'm not going to say Jim Henson could not have pulled this off. Yeah. Because he was the original. He, he you got to remember, Kermit the Frog is the oldest Muppet, and until... Th- is the oldest Muppet. And until this uh, production, mm-hmm. Jim Henson was the only one who played Kermit. Yeah. Jim Henson knows new Kermit better than anybody is ever going to. Oh, yeah. And the fact that Steve Whitmire could come in and play that role so perfectly yeah. and understand all really on his first major role in the character how to handle a scene where Kermit the Frog has to be broken something Jim Henson never really had to do yeah and pull it off so amazingly he's got my props yeah I very much appreciate him for that and that's still one of the hardest moments in all of cinema for me to watch wow is Kermit the Frog of all people being broken not because it's done badly but because it's done so perfectly. Gotcha. That I actually, it it stirs up emotions in me. And it has, I can't say it did that the first time, because the first time I was seven. (laughs) I don't remember what my first time watching this was like, other than I was amazed that the Muppets were on the big screen. And you could go somewhere and watch movies, watch television, as far as I knew, on a big screen. (laughs) Uh, But... Yeah, that is my third like, and yeah. What's your third like? Wow, I follow that up. Sorry, it's... <laughs> no, you're good, you're good. That, the, that, that, was, that was very... It's what I've never really been able to get out when I've talked to people about this movie before, because like you can kind of see people's eyes glaze over. Yeah. Y'all are all a stuck cap- listening to me. Y'all yeah. are a t- captive audience, yes. so y'all are going to get the whole thing. <laughs> And plus, I've done a lot of thinking on it since I watched this movie Saturday to make sure I remembered, got exactly what I wanted to say. I got said. you. Well, thank you for sharing your heart on that one. Yes. That's really cool. Uh, my third would actually be the mastery of that, the puppeteering. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, mind you, my relation with Jim Henson puppetry is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. Yes. So, I do have an understanding. Well, and Yoda. And Yoda, of course. But the the way these characters are manipulated and carved and created, mm-hmm. that they have this, they have a life to them in knowing that they're puppets. They're yeah. simply just, there's some person's hand, you know, going through this puppet, and there's like another, like one or two people manipulating something else. But you become invested in these characters. Mm-hmm. The. You almost forget that they're puppets exactly. after a while. Yeah, exactly. And not in the same way you forget on a, a hand-drawn animation or a 3D animation that they're they're fake. Oh, yeah. It's different with this because, I guess because they're in a l- real-life setting. Mm-hmm. Or, or at least a live-action setting. Yes. The... Like I said before, you find yourself invested in these characters mm-hmm. that, that... Like I said, my number one was uh, Rizzo. And the fact that I felt bad for the character knowing he's a puppet. And they were like, this puppet isn't going to get hurt. But I was like, oh, poor Rizzo. He's going to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, just how these people will be like, the Jim Henson company has done this for how long? Kermit the Frog premiered in a show called Salmon Friends back in the 1960s, early 60s. Which yeah. Was, and Salmon Friends was a black and white... Uh, public access show in Washington, D.C. that very little footage remains from. But that is the Kermit the Frog that was made out of Jim Henson's mother's nightgown. <laughs> I heard something about that. but And that's the, and he wasn't even a frog in that one. He was actually a lizard. But um, he was the first one. Rolf the dog is probably the second. That's the uh, piano playing dog. Oh, yeah. He was the second. He was created first for a dog food commercial, but then he mostly, or his most of his character came from was on a little show called the Jimmy Dean Show. Oh, okay. You know the the sausage Jimmy Dean sausage. Yes. Well, the guy they that name comes from. Yeah. He's he was a musician back in the day, and he had a television show, you know, one of these country western variety shows. Yeah. And every once in a while, they'd go talk to. Uh, you know, the, the ranch ha- ranch dog, Rolf, played by Jim Henson with someone else doing the other hand. In fact, he in fact uh, Rolf had a uh, crush on Lassie. 
<laughs> Which okay. went really well when Lassie was the special guest. Oh, that, that, <laughs> that would be funny to watch. You should look it up. You can find it on YouTube. Oh, okay. Uh, but it is a black and white show. And uh, it, it actually, if um, if you have are near satellite set, yeah. if you have satellite or cable television, yeah. uh, the channel RFD TV, I think, is the only place where you can actually find the shows being bro- the ep- the reruns being broadcast? Yeah. Just wa- if you happen to see the Jimmy Dean show on RFD, just watch it for Rolf because Rolf is in top form in those. Uh, but then pretty much every other Muppet that is considered a Muppet that was not Sesame Street yeah. Muppets, uh, or quote unquote everything that is. Uh, that is now considered by Disney the Muppets. Yeah, would have is in any that pretty much started with the Muppet Show, which was in the seventies, which is where Fozzie Bear was created. His uh, Statler and Waldorf as his hecklers. Hmm. Uh, Miss Piggy was the show was the show's diva. Mm. That was that was the idea behind, and Gonzo was the show's stuntman. That they makes were sense. they were designed these these Muppets were designed specifically to fill these role th- these roles in a variety show a variety stage show va- almost vaudeville style stage show and then it got so popular that they made the Muppet movie and that Muppet movie spawned more movies and every once in a while they needed new Muppets hmm. come in, that's where Rizzo came from that's where Bean Bunny came from in fact, uh, you know the the street urchin kid yeah. that sings uh, jolly good. Uh, Good King wants this list at the beginning and then yeah. has to carry the turkey around in the end. Oh, yeah. His first thing was, uh, and I actually, this was actually the first Muppet thing I think I watched and wore a tape out over. Mm-hmm. The Muppets at Walt Disney World. I heard about that one. It's a, it's a hard one to find. Yeah. I'm really hoping it shows up on Disney Plus because it's one I would like to watch again and see how well it's aged. Yeah. <laughs> Because I'm not sure it's aged well. But the funny one on that is uh, that's one of the few times Disney officially showed the Utilidors at Disney World. Really? Because Gonzo happened to find himself down there and found himself in heaven. Because to him, that was the greatest thing he'd ever seen at Disney World was the laundry room and the trash compactor. Wow. <laughs> All right. So there's even a whole love song between him and Camilla down there. But wow. being the bunny was in that was that was the first thing he was from. Okay. But uh yeah, I, I can go off on this for a while. Okay. Uh I will say before we get into our dislikes, I'm probably going to make you watch the rest of the Muppet movies, but I'm going to be nice and kind of go more in order <laughs> so you can Get a better idea as to who the, who these characters were as they grow. I got you. Plus, I am not throwing you into the two newest Muppet movies until you've seen the old ones. Okay, then. I guarantee you of that because there are jokes in there. All anyway. Right. All right. So, with that, with that, you know, thank you for that very lengthy, in, <laughs> in, lengthy in-depth uh, history of the Muppets. Not that that was intended, but it's what you got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, there is this robust history of the Muppets and mm-hmm. these these actors behind these these beloved yes. characters know what they're doing. Be like, look at Labyrinth, and, look at uh, Dark and most and, and most that. of the Mupp- Muppet performers in this, with the exception of Jim Henson and Richard Hunt, who the movie was dedicated in memory of. They're the same Muppet performers who were doing those roles back in the seventies in the Ooh. original show. There was very few new people on this production. Yeah, you huh. didn't even get Elmo in there. The guy who did Elmo did a bunch of other Muppet stuff after this, but oh, okay. he uh, he's not in this one. Thank you. I don't like that guy. <laughs> yeah. For obvious reasons. Yes. Anyway. So, yes. Um, yeah, that was... Yeah. Muppets, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Fantastic work. Uh, definitely props to those people that just be like, spent basically a lifetime working on how to do these Muppets and how yeah. to create them and... Just wow! Mm-hmm. Just there again. So let's get into our dislikes. Yes, our dislikes. My dislikes are mostly nitpicks. Okay, I'm just giving that warning right now. Yeah. The first nitpick is the fact that some of these special effects did not age as well as I would like. Right. This is probably the only fair nitpick I can give to this one that you can actually see in the movie. Yeah. Uh, the 
effect. Uh, the, the animated sparkles on the Ghost of Christmas Present as he's disappearing look cheap. And definitely as an added on effect, they do not help the scene at all. And as much as I love Photoshop uh, swirl whirlpool swirls, it looked like they weren't... It, it, it kind of works and it kind of doesn't. Yeah. Because it has the otherworldly effect of walking towards, of, you know, yeah, of the perspective being odd. But at the same time, it's like, that does not age well. It yeah. just does not look as good as, I, mean, I could live with it if it had kind of more of a tunnel effect. Yeah. But it doesn't. It's obviously just a flat, it's obviously the frame being liquefied. Yeah. And... They're walking into a blue screen and kind of walking towards this obvious... It doesn't work as well as I would like. And they do that twice. Well, once on one side of the portal, once on the other. Yeah. It just doesn't work as well for me, special effect-wise. Yeah. I wouldn't... There's a part of me that wants them to fix it, and a part of me that's like, leave it alone just for... To be honest. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I just don't like that. That... Parts of this movie didn't age well. Okay. Those two parts in particular. Mm. Anyway, what's your first dislike? All right. Well, my dislike wasn't really a dislike. It was kind of a kind of a letdown. Mm-hmm. Kind of a letdown of the film. That Jim Henson wasn't part of it. Yeah. The, the fact that, you know, like Jim Henson was so engrossed and so tied in with the Muppets that my first ever watching of a Muppet film, he wasn't part of his passing. Mm-hmm. What was it, 1991 he passed away? Yeah, and if you want to see something interesting, look up his funeral on YouTube. Oh, okay. Because Muppets attended as well. Oh, of course. But it was they were being held up by the people in the audience. Yeah. It's so like, while I'm fairly certain the the puppeteers who, voiced, who played specific Muppets got yeah. that one, there were still a bunch of people who were holding up random ones. Yeah. But, oh, and that... Reminded me of something else. Never mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just yeah. Well, the the fact there again be like my kind of relationship or my connection mm-hmm. with you know was Turtles, and after what you know watching Turtles two and understanding that he had passed away like during the production of Turtles two, mm-hmm. like was sad. And now you know watching this and understanding more the gravity, the gravitas of his loss. That yeah. would be like the company kept on be like was continued well, and now is you know you know has been bought by disney or the well, let the me Muppets explain have. that so um jim henson prior to his passing yeah. he was actually in the middle of talks with disney to buy jim henson productions yeah at the time but when he passed and the rights and it, like, literally it was in the final stages oh wow when the rights when he passed and the rights passed of the muppets went to his family his family apparently did not was not happy with the deals that Jim had made. Yeah, for whatever reason, I don't know the specifics. Uh, and they backed out of a lot, but they did go ahead and continue with the Disney did talk, uh, convince them to at least a two into a two movie deal, which yeah. would be this movie Muppet Christmas Carol and Muppet Treasure Island. Yes, uh, it then went of course elsewhere for a couple. For for two for for one movie, and a couple other you know side projects. Yeah, and then Walt Disney Walt Disney ended up buying the Muppets and another show that Jim Henson Productions had done that was an educational show called Bear in the Big Blue House. Yeah, for I don't remember how much money, and I think if I remember correctly, they were buying more Bear in the Big Blue House than they were Muppets. Yeah, but they went ahead and took it anyway because Muppets sold. Yeah, and. Yeah, that's why Disney has the Muppets. They still do not have two movies. Okay. Which is um, Muppets Take Manhattan and Muppets from Space. Okay. But pretty much any other major Muppet thing yeah. is owned by Disney at this point. Okay. So, yeah, that would be like my kind of disappointment with probably that Jim Henson mm-hmm. was no longer involved, you know, due to this passing. So that was yeah. kind of a kind of a letdown. Mm-hmm. But you know it's it's understandable because you can't exactly. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was my only real dislike or yeah, yeah. So what's yours? My number two. There are a lot of good songs in this movie. 
Paul Williams did an amazing job with yeah for a s- story that really doesn't lend itself to being a musical. Mm-hmm. He did very good at writing a musical, making musical out of it. Right. But one of the songs that he wrote that got filmed ended up on the cutting room floor. Hmm. Do you remember the very end of the movie and they're singing The Love We Found? Mm -hmm. That's technically a callback to a song that did get cut called that was played during um, Young Ebenezer and Belle. Yeah. I think that's his girlfriend's name. I get Belle and Clara mixed up Mm -hmm. all the time. They had a song there called The Love We Lost that was kind of heartbreaking if you can hear it. And the strange thing is, is the pop version that was sung by other people, yeah. is still in the end credits. Really? Yeah. It's after uh, the redo of Wherever You f- Find Love Feels Like Christmas. It's yeah. after that. So it's after most people have turned the movie off. Yeah. But it's so weird that it's still in there, and it's probably the most depressing song in, an, in, a, Chris, in a Christmas movie. And it's still there, despite the fact what it's based on is gone. But it was in the television version. Hmm. The problem is the television version was edited in, as you can probably guess, 480i, 4x3. Yeah. And for whatever reason, Disney's never gone back and made a deluxe version that included that in the theatrical cut. And it's actually done, and while it does slow the movie down a little bit and might start getting the kids a little distracted, Nancy, because there's no Muppets in these shots. Yeah. And it kind of goes on for three or four minutes when you watch watch the cut. It really makes that scene better that song being in there and because you can kind of feel it being cut out when you know it's supposed to be there because you can tell something's missing the scene goes too fast and I, i'm kind of sad that it's not there but anyway what's your second dislike my second uh if you have one really i don't have a second dislike the the fact that this movie was so well done mm-hmm. and and honestly my first viewing i'll probably have to go watch it again but it was just really good. It was a mm-hmm. really good, charming, amazing, incredibly talented, well done film that definitely I might watch again and be like, I'll probably want to watch it again and might wind up being another Christmas movie I watch. <laughs> Maybe. What is your number three? I'm not sure I have a number three other than... The cop out I did for the my Totoro dislike, and I'm, I kind of it kind of stinks that it that it ended. And I kind of wish yeah. it kept going to some degree, despite the fact the story was done. Um, or like your name, yeah. It's like anyway, except there's nowhere where the story can go after yeah. God blesses everyone. I hate that it ends because it's a. It's a two hours I always look forward to getting a chance to watch every year. Yeah. Putting towards this movie because it's so well done. Agreed. And I'm glad that my viewing this year got to be thrown into this podcast. Good but, deal. Yeah. So, uh, you don't have a number three? No, I do not. Okay, so we'll move into our ratings. I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody that this movie's getting a very... It almost isn't a 10 because of the the special effects I mentioned, yeah. but it's mostly a 10. <laughs> I got you. Because I just love this movie so much. So it's a 9.5... It's probably a 9.99 repeating that I'm rounding up to 10. I got you. It's not perfect. Not by a long shot. No. But almost every single imperfection you could laud at it, with the exception of the two I mentioned... Adds to the charm, if that makes any sense. Yes. So, yeah, that's why I rated a 10. I'm going to give it a solid 8. Like, a solid 8. There, mm-hmm. There's no little wiggle room or make you know, go back or trying to, you know, progress it back. It's an amazing film. It's an amazing, again, well-talented, incredibly executed film that just tugs at your heartstrings, make you, makes you feel for a bunch of puppets. Mm-hmm. And the... The comedy, I'm be like, now granted, there's some of the comedy I don't understand because I've never had a real, like, Muppets have never been in my wheelhouse, mm-hmm. which apparently is going to change, apparently. I'm just going to make you watch <laughs> one, two, three, four, 
five, maybe six movies. <laughs> okay, then. But I'm going to make you watch more than that that's not Muppet-related this year anyway, so... Okay. What's the difference? Yeah, that's true. Or next year coming in 2000. That's what I mean, this coming year. Yeah. 2020. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it's a solid eight for me. It's an enjoyable film. Uh, there again, like I said earlier, I'll probably I will watch this again and probably want to making this a part of like a yearly thing of watching it during Christmas. And uh, yeah, there again, thank you, Drew, for putting this on the on the list mm-hmm. and making me watch this thing because it was incredible. And so, if you are interested in watching this film, you could probably buy it on Amazon. Or you can, if you have Disney Plus, it's on yes. Disney Plus. So, uh, as I always do, I put up a post on Facebook. Yes. Telling people what we're reviewing and asking for their thoughts. Yes. I finally realized if I give people a week, I'll actually get a couple <laughs> instead of a couple days. So, um, the first one is from uh, Carla. I'm going to admit this is my mother. Mm hmm. <laughs> Uh, not that that's a bad thing, Mom. Don't take that the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> but she says, uh, this is one of my absolute favorites. And if I can get the other one to come up. Because <laughs> Facebook is being stupid on me right now. Like it does. Oh, wait. that's I need to go into group, not... I read from the page. I need to read in the group. Uh... Come on, look. Okay. And uh, Josh Adams says, it's an interesting take on one of my all-time favorite Christmas stories. So that was the two reactions we got for this episode. If you want to have your thoughts on the episode read on the podcast, uh, please uh, look for those posts both on the Facebook page and the Facebook group, which we'll talk more about here in a minute, for uh, my post where I talk about what we're doing, what movie is upcoming. Mm -hmm. Now, the next two weeks, the episodes have been are already been recorded by the time this episode comes out. So we will not have posts for the next two weeks. But go ahead and be thinking about your thoughts on what our first Don Bluth movie of January is, which is what, Jacob? American Tell. Ah. Not Five Will Goes West, but the no, original the American original, Tale. The original. Now Don Blue movies for me is kind of special because the first movie I ever saw in theaters was actually a Don Bluth movie. Ah. Uh, a Land Before Time. <laughs> Which we'll be doing eventually. Yes. This we, week. This this coming month. This coming month. So yeah, be prepared for uh, movies that shook the eighties, shook Disney to its core. Mm-hmm. It made Disney run for its money. <laughs> yeah. During the 80s. So, yeah, we will be doing Don Bluth Month in January. Mm-hmm. All right, so be prepared and for, that, for, for that. And the next two weeks, we're going to do a short next week mm-hmm. about our favorite Christmas movies. Yeah. And specials and TV episodes. And then I believe the one after that, which is going to be the week of uh, the Saturday. Uh, yeah, it's the Saturday before New Year's, but yeah. after Christmas. We're going to be reviewing a short connected to Prep and Landing. Those two uh, holiday specials that came out, Christmas specials that came out back in 2009 and 2010, I think. Something like that. Something to that effect. We're doing this, the short that's connected to it. Yeah. Which will be interesting. Yes. So keep an eye out for those. Or ear for it. Yes. Or something. I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah. Be, uh, keep... I was going to say something about creatures stirring, but never mind. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we guess we should move into our uh, our stuff. Well, uh, before that, because I think we missed one step. And be like, is this movie family oh, friendly? We because we usually do that during yes. the other part. Yes, we do. Uh, yes, this movie is extremely family friendly. Yes, uh, there are some dark scenes, especially during the Ghost of Christmas. Yet to come. Yes. Because like I said, that is where Gonzo and Rizzo disappear. Because these are dark scenes. And this is where the climax of the movie is. And it's the scariest part of the movie, too. True. So, and let's face it. The ghost of Christmas yet to come is very just scary for a kid. Very scary. It's got no face. Yeah. Um, It's got, didn't have a skull either, but it's fine. So, yeah. All right. I think it's family friendly. Do you yeah. think it's family friendly? Oh, I completely agree. I okay. agree with you. So, where can they find us? 
I was about to ask you that where can they find you? Okay, well, you can find me on Facebook at Jigaby Heron, and you can also follow me at my artistic endeavors on my other Facebook page, which is Jigaby's Daily Art Corner, where I try to draw every day. Uh, sometimes I succeed, sometimes not. But it's a it's a very fun journey. I've been doing it for nearly two and a half years, mm-hmm. something like that. And uh, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jacob B. Heron. And I think be like, personally, I've got a few projects in the wings that be like, also, we have this super secret project we're both working on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so look forward to maybe a few things in 2020, possibly. Where can they find you, Drew? You can also find me on Facebook under Drew Dodgen. Also, check out my photo bin that I'll eventually get around to uplo- updating. Uh, to see photographs that I've taken. And, uh, of course, you can also find me on Twitter at ggeorge759. And uh, I am going to go ahead and tease a little bit more of our super secret project coming up. Okay. Sometime around Christmas, Mm -hmm. you're going to want to keep an eye out for a couple changes Mm -hmm. in the Facebook group uh, that will show what our next project is and mm. the first releases for that project yeah are going to be coming out around that time also around christmas so yeah. keep an eye out for that yeah it is something i think we're both excited for yes that we're doing with uh, your brother jim yes so yeah keep an eye out for that you can find us both on our website at thecellcast.podbean.com. There you will find links to uh, listen to us all, along with every episode. You will find links to listen to us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. You will also find a link to our Facebook group. You will notice it is no longer closed. Ah. Oh. So, invite your friends. We can't keep them out. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Not that we were going to keep them out anyway, but we're going to be doing our best to keep the bots out, which I don't know how that's going to go, but we can get a couple people who would be, might be spooked away from that. Yeah. Um, also you can follow us on Twitter at cast underscore cell. If I remember to actually update it, because I don't think, I think I've missed the past couple weeks, but, um, keep an eye out there. And, uh, you can email us at the cellcast podcast at gmail.com. And I'm thinking that the only thing I have left to tell you is that every time you hear the word uh, the cellcast, that is with a single L. Yes. I think that's about it. Do you have anything else? Uh, the only thing I can think of, we we did a, uh, a hat run of we doing hats mm-hmm. uh, a couple of months back. Uh, I will be getting the hats in. Uh, I believe at the end of this week. So, if you have ordered hats in the past, or you're still interested in hats, I probably have probably f- a couple extra at least. A couple of extra. And so, if you are interested, a number. yeah. And so, I think I have like one or two that might be available. So, if you are interested in a hat, it's gonna be twenty-two dollars. And so, get a hold of me on Facebook. And just, you know, let's start working on, you mm-hmm. know, getting you this uh, merch. And with any luck, you'll be close enough we can get it to you before Christmas. Exactly. Oh, we've got connections where we can get it to you. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. So if you live in Wyoming, it might take a little while. Hey, Thomas? <laughs> unless, Tommy? You're, <laughs> unless you're willing to spend the money for express mail. Yeah. But anyway, (laughs) anyway, uh, I guess uh, that brings us to the end. So I uh, think so. This is Drew. This is Jacob. And we'll catch you in the next frame. Merry Christmas. (laughs) Ah, yes. God bless us, everyone.
next time on Cellcast. I think it sounds uh, melodious. With music be the food of love. Play on, Macduff, play on. I don't know which is worse, the music or the Shakespeare. <sighs> Rats! The snores, the snores here. It keeps getting in the way. You, you could stop playing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's funny. I've never known a cockroach with good taste. But I've known plenty that taste <laughs> good. <laughs> play, play, play. Mooring teeth. Yo. You're not a rat, you're a cat. How'd you get in here? Come here, you little... Ah! <laughs> Gentlemen, cat's out of the bag. Get me that mouse!